just waiting for people to join us but if you're wanting to say a little hello in the chat that would be great to tell us where you're from um how many people are watching with you whether you're all alone not all alone on the webinars which is great <laughs> so i want to welcome you all here to our stem careers role model webinars for today um, our speaker today is associate professor heiko dietrich and i just want to as we gather for this meeting from different places around Australia, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which we meet. I'm joining you today from Ngunnawal and Ngambri land. I pay respect to elders past and present and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who join us online today as we share and discuss our knowledge and practices. We acknowledge the deep knowledge forever embedded in custodianship of country of our first scientists. Yes. Little bit of debate on what's going on with Mr. Samuel in the chat. But to, these uh, webinars are really a great chance for us to have some uh, really engaged early scientists talk to us about their careers, about what they're working on, and how fascinating STEM careers can be for all of you out there. So if you have any questions at all, there is a Q&A function at the bottom next to the chat function put any questions you want to ask us at any point in that and we will get to them a little bit later on or during the talk if, if I can spot something that's really spot on we might answer it during the talk we'll have um but definitely have a have a chat in the in the chat and and keep going but listen up if you didn't receive the worksheet that goes along with it please email us and let us know and we can send it and there will be a survey for you to do afterwards but for now i'm going to hand across to our presenter today and say welcome heiko well thank you very much camille and welcome everyone here online in zoomville um yes so i've prepared a couple of slides so i think i simply share them and then we can start here we are. Okay, let me just rearrange my display. Okay, so I have my the chat window open here. So if I catch something, I, I will try to respond to that. Yeah, so thank again, thank you for giving me the opportunity um, to be part of this program. I think it's a it's a great initiative, and I hope um, I can contribute a little bit to this um, to this project. Now, what am I doing today? I will talk a little bit about my career path. How did I become a mathematician? You know, what is my job actually about? But I will also say a few words about, you know, what is mathematics actually about? You know, what do I think about mathematics? And at the end, I will maybe a tiny bit talk about my own research, but um, yeah, we will see if time allows that. Um, as the cartoon here shows, there are also a couple of misconceptions um, when you think about mathematics. You know, when I talk about my job outside and people hear that I'm a mathematician, I hear all sorts of things. And um, one of the reactions is quite accurately reflected by this cartoon because people usually think that uh, if someone is interested in math or is doing lots of math riddles, that they are sort of a little bit nerdy and not socially competent. But I hope I can demonstrate to you that this is not necessarily the case. <clears throat> so how did I come to mathematics? Well, as you might hear from my strong accent, I didn't grow up in Australia. I actually grew up in Germany. So I went to school in Germany. This is my high school. It's called Martino Caterineum. It was founded in 1415, so it's quite old compared to how old Australia is. Um, I went to school for 13 years. And overall, I think it's fair to say that I liked subjects which were more about objective answers. You know, I liked sciences in general, I liked mathematics, and I also liked Latin. What I didn't like so much was literature, like English, German, and French. Now, Latin is obviously also language, but the way it was taught, it was rather a highly structured way. You know, we just spent time on translating like a paragraph per lesson. And you know, it wasn't about speaking, it was rather about analyzing the structure. Um, analyzing the structure of a sentence. So, so this is sort of my school preferences. I like like science in general. <clears throat> and at that time, it wasn't quite clear to me what I wanted to do afterwards. So I, I knew that I wanted to go to university. Um, but you know, what subject to study, that was really not clear to me. I um, was interested in computer science or engineering. I did like mathematics, but the problem is, you know, when you think about it, you have 
some good ideas what a computer scientist is doing, if maybe some good ideas what an engineering is doing. I just didn't know what can you do with a math degree. Yeah, I was pretty clueless, but I ended up studying mathematics. And why is this so? This was actually one of the main key points in my career. My math teacher at school, he knew someone who is a math professor. And because I was interested in mathematics, he introduced me to this professor to work on some school project. And uh, sorry, I'm a bit confused by the chat. There's a lot of stuff going on, which is irrelevant. Um, so I talked to this professor and, and basically we talked about, you know, what is math about and what can you do with a math university degree? And this finally convinced me to, to study mathematics, even though I still had no idea what exactly I want to do after my studies. So I did this. I got my diploma in, in mathematics and I liked it so much that I thought, okay, well, I want to continue with mathematics. Uh, let's do a PhD. So I did a PhD in mathematics afterwards. Um, so title of my thesis, periodic structure. So the graph associated with the P groups of maxima class. It's probably the only thing I will talk about, uh, mention about my PhD. But um, what next? Huh? So I did nine years at university studying mathematics, five years undergraduate and four years PhD. And um, sorry, this chat is just, actually I turn off the chat. So Camille, if you can tell me that if something relevant comes up, then let me know. <clears throat> but, but then there was the crucial question. I had to think about, well, what do I do next? You know, I had my PhD in mathematics. There has to be a decision in which way I want to go. Now at that time, there was an opportunity, my supervisor, she went to New Zealand for a research um, visiting like fellowship. And she asked me if I wanted to join her. So eventually it turned out that I started a postdoc um, position at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. So maybe for those of you who don't know how this goes, if you want to stay in academia after you have completed your um, university degree or your PhD, then the usual thing is to have short-term positions one or two years at different places over all over the world. It's called a postdoctoral position. And the main aim is really to establish yourself as an independent researcher. So by being at a different university, you grow your academic network, you work on new projects, and essentially you just grow and become more mature as, as an academic. So my first postdoc position you now led me to New Zealand um, in Auckland. And this was really, really great, great opportunity. I met lots of good people and I also was able to secure another fellowship after that. So as I said, these are short term positions. So once you started, you have already to think about what to do next. You have to start applying for jobs. And after that, I got a, another postdoc position, a, a European Union Marie Curie Fellowship at the University of Trento in Italy. So I went back to the other side of the globe, back to Europe and um, had two years in Italy, which was also great, as you can see here on the picture. And once I've come, uh, once I came close to the end of that fellowship, I was actually ready to apply for permanent jobs at, at universities. And this is when I went back to the other side of the globe, back to Down Under, um, Monash University, where I am employed now since 2013. So this is um, the campus of Monash University. Um, I have to say the shiny, shiny building at the front is not the math building. The math building is at the end, like this boring rectangular cuboid. <laughs> but this is all we mathematicians need. We don't need any shiny buildings. So this is it. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm there now since 2013. I um, have a teaching and research position and I'm, I'm quite happy. There. So this is sort of my, my pathway. So in a nutshell, I would, summarize my career journey as follows as followed um, so at school i basically focused on stem as i said i liked science and math i did a math degree afterwards i did a phd in mathematics subsequently then i had postdoc positions at two universities and then i got a permanent job the story is not over yet because you know permanent job doesn't mean that you can lean back and do nothing there are ongoing challenges as an academic you have to have grant success, you have to produce research outputs, 
and so on and so on in order to you know maintain your status so it's it's the ongoing challenges and opportunities so it's, it's really exciting i say a few more words about that um in a second i just want to summarize that it's really long journey you know when you look at this list here that have been years of studying and years of work experience and it's really hard to say you know when you're at school to say oh i want to become a professor in subject x i mean it's good to have this aspiration but it's a long way it's a long way and there are many hurdles to take and and you have to really reconsider after each milestone you know what are my choices what are my options what are my likings and how can i proceed so it's good and bad it's good to the extent that you don't have to say i do this and this is uh, like a one way street after each of these um, milestones undergraduate degree phd and so on you can reevaluate and you can you know decide what else to do um, it's not just being reasonably good in what you do. It's also um, that you need a good portion of luck. You know, for example, if you are ready with your degree and you look for postdoc positions, you know, there has to be the right timing. You have to have the right job openings at the right time, and you have to be lucky enough to get them. And I think this is an aspect this one really shouldn't underestimate. There is a huge portion of luck involved um, in order to get your way up in in the system. But to some extent, one can influence that. And this is my last point on this slide here. And um, I think one aspect I've learned is that it is really important to, to network. You know, it's, it's very important to reach out and ask for people to be mentoring you and to give you advice. And yeah, so, so that's very, very important. And I myself have been very lucky to have had mentors that were very, very um, supportive throughout my career. So punchline is it's a, it's a very long journey. It's good to have this aspiration, but you also have lots of opportunities to reevaluate um, your opportunities along the way. Now, what is my job actually about? You know, so some of you might know someone who works at university, so you have already an idea of how this works. Others have no idea whatsoever. So I thought I'd just briefly explain what I'm doing. So I'm an associate professor in pure mathematics. Technically, I'm doing 40% research. 40% teaching and 20% service or engagement, whatever that means. So roughly summarized, you could say in the research component, I'm solving exciting research problems. Um, I have a lot of collaborators and co-authors in various countries. So we, we work on all these problems collaboratively, which is very exciting. Teaching wise, you know, obviously I'm doing undergraduate lectures, I'm teaching undergraduates, I'm teaching honor students, I have um, master of philosophy students and i'm also supervising phd students so so this is a really important aspect of my my work as well because obviously training the next generation of scientists teachers is is very very important and you know to be honest this aspect is probably having a greater impact than the fundamental research i'm doing and then in service it's broadly covered by saying you know contributing to the discipline so you have editorial duties uh, personally, I'm the director of postgraduate studies, which means I'm overseeing our PhD program. And obviously, you also do other stuff like outreach activities, um, like the talk today. One aspect which I want to highlight is what I didn't expect when I started studying mathematics. I didn't expect that as a mathematician, you are so internationally connected. You know, I really thought, you know, as a mathematician, you sit in the office, you solve math riddles or math problems, and that's it. But as I said, I have a lot of collaborators from different countries. And here's a list of countries I've been invited to or traveled to for conferences or research. A um, couple of those countries are in brackets because I was invited, but due to COVID, I couldn't travel. So we had an online an online event. So you see, it's, it's, it's the opposite of being locked up in your office and working by yourself, it's it's highly collaborative. And this aspect is really something I I embrace. I really like this about my my job. <clears throat> so what about mathematics? Well obviously that's also one of these stereotypes. If you say I'm a mathematician, then people think, well, <laughs> isn't isn't math already solved? Isn't there actually anything left to do? And that's obviously not true. And it's sort of stemmed in the misconception that mathematics is essentially what you do at school. So I want to highlight here that mathematics is not necessarily equal 
to the type of mathematics you see um, at school. And to give you, uh, yeah, I mean, this cartoon actually highlights this also, also pretty well. So in, in fact, uh, I'm very bad at doing calculations in my head, for example, which is probably something you all are very capable of. Um, so that's a different aspect of mathematics and I come to that in a sec. So what, what do I like about mathematics then? Well, I guess it's not a secret that math is underpinning most of our technology today, right? I mean, you all have heard that, that basically everything is based on mathematics. This is not my personal motivation. I come to that later, but my personal motivation is rather like a philosophical aspect. So for me, math is nice because it develops absolute truth. Yeah? Yeah. So comparing this to other disciplines like medicine or biology, where your models basically um, develop the more you know about the world. In mathematics, what you have proved basically stays true um, forever. One example is Pythagorean theory. Now, usually I would ask the class, you know, can someone tell me what Pythagorean theorem is? And usually people say, well, this is like a square plus b square equals c square. And then I ask, well, but what are a, b, and c? And then they say, well, these are the side length of a right angle triangle, right? So this is probably something you, you have learned at school. And then I say, well, you actually have to be careful about the statement because I can show you a right angle triangle that has three equal sides. And again, I usually would ask if someone can see how this can happen, um, which is not possible right now, unfortunately. So let me just show you. If I take a globe or like a sphere, I can actually draw a triangle that has three right angles and all the side length are exactly equal. Right? So this is a right angle triangle and all the three side lengths are exactly equal. So here we don't have that Pythagoras theorem seems to hold, right? So this is just highlighting that one has to be really careful when stating mathematical results. So to, to state Pythagoras theorem correctly, you would have to say right angle triangle, like depicted here in the Euclidean plane, you have to have a triangle in the plane, satisfies this equation. Well, so far so good. So what do I think is amazing about that? This has been established more than two and a half thousand years ago. Yeah. And this holds true forever for all possible triangles. Now, and here, here comes the crux. There are infinitely many right angle triangles. How do you check them all? Now, if I give you a rec, um, right angle triangle, you can measure it and you say, okay, that's true. But I could imagine a triangle that is bigger than our solar system. How do you measure that? You can't really, right? So how can you verify such a statement which is about infinitely many objects um, without doing it practically? And this is where mathematics kicks in. You need to have a mathematical argument, what's called a proof. So for time reasons, I go through this very quickly because I assume you have done this at school. One way, one of the many ways to do this is to take four of these triangles and arrange them in this picture. And then you compute the area of this bigger square here, let's call it A, in two different ways. Now the side length of this bigger square is a plus b, right? So this whole area is a plus b times a plus b. So we get this formula. But you can also see that this area is made up out of the white triangle in the middle, which has side length c. And then we have four triangles, each of the same shape. So we can also compute the area this way. Now the area we computed is the same in both cases. It's the area of this bigger square. So if we equate this, we actually get Pythagoras theory. And this is a mathematical argument that holds for any right angle triangle, yeah? no matter how big it is. Yeah? And this is like the essence of what I like about mathematics. It's, it's creating absolute truth that stay true forever since this result has been um, established. Let me do something more interactive without numbers maybe. <clears throat> also to in, in illustrate a different aspect of mathematics. So suppose there are three rooms, <clears throat> three rooms, room one, two, and three, and they should be tiled with these domino tiles, 1.2 and 2.1. Uh, and we want to do this without breaking any tiles. The question is, can we do it? Right? So let's look at the first room. And again, when I do school outreach in person, I usually bring a bit of Lego and hand it out and, you know, you can just play around and see what's going on. And um, then you'll see pretty easily that room one is possible. You can do that. 
And when I ask you, you know, why is it possible? Basically, you can just demonstrate it to me. For example, like this, you know, I just put down these tiles in this fashion and you see that the whole room is covered and I haven't cut any tiles, right? And then we go over to room two and I let you play around and yet you will see that this is not possible. You can't cover all the squares without breaking any tiles. And then the question is why? And then you might observe that, you know, whatever you cover with your tile always covers two of these squares. So whatever you cover, it covers an even number of those little squares. Here we have three times three equal nine squares. So you can never cover that. So it's an argument that tells us we can never, we can never <clears throat> um, cover an odd number of squares. All right. And now let's look at room number three. Room number three has an even number of squares, 62. So, you know, the previous argument doesn't tell us it's not possible. And then usually I let students play around with it for a couple of minutes, you know, they try to solve it and they realize, you know, somehow they can never find a solution. And then I ask, well, can you never find a solution or haven't you just not spent enough time finding a solution, <clears throat> right? So the question is, can we find an argument that tells us either you can do it, well, if you can do it, then you will be able to find a solution and you can just show it to me. But what you do if it's not possible? Yeah? You, you can't probably go through all different possibilities that might take a very long time. So it's an argument you can, you can bring forward to say that it's not possible. And here comes the trick. Just impose a chessboard coloring on the structure. It almost looks like a chessboard, right? So take a chessboard and cut out, out two opposite edges here, <coughs> corners. And then observe that we have 30 gray or black squares and 32 white squares, right? Now, what happens when you put down a domino on this board? You always cover one black and one white one. No matter where you put it, you always cover one black and one white one. So whatever you cover with your two dominoes, it will always cover the same amount of black and gray squares. But this configuration here has more white squares than gray squares. And this tells us you can never do it. And when you do it in school and you have tried this yourself for 10 minutes, and then you explain the solution, this really is a eureka moment. I've seen students like shouting out, ah, oh, well, this is how it's working out. It's, it's quite amazing. And, and this is mathematics. Yeah? It has nothing to do with doing calculations or manipulating numbers. What we have done is we saw a problem we have imposed more structure. We have observed an invariant. We have observed that wherever you put it, you have the same number covered of white and, and gray squares. And then we conclude the final impossibility of, of, of this dilation. So this is mathematics as well. Right? Mathematics is about finding arguments and having um, well, good reasoning skills. So keep this in mind. Math is not just about solving equations. <clears throat> So this was my personal opinion why I think math is important. Let me maybe recall some facts, why uh, more objective facts, why I think one should learn more mathematics. Um, first of all, math is important. You know, it's the language of science. You have to realize mathematics has been invented by human for a reason, yeah? namely to make, uh, to make um, scientists able to communicate more rigorously and more efficiently. Yeah? So every scientific area, whatever you think about, uses mathematics this way or the other. Right? Mathematics is the foundation of our like technologies today. I mean, there's no way around it. So it is important. Also mathematics is just, at school is just the tip of the iceberg. So I usually like to compare learning math as learning a language. Yeah? It's really quite similar. And what you do at school is I would say you learn the vocabulary, you learn the basic spelling and the grammar. This is very, very important. You need to know the vocabulary and you need to know your grammar, otherwise you can't, you can't speak math. But I would say advanced mathematics goes way beyond that. And so you could compare this in the language setting to poems and literature. Yeah, so what you do at school is sort of the foundation, but the real mathematics, so to speak, goes way beyond that. And that's important to realize because most people who don't do math after school, they think, okay, school math is math and that's it. This is totally not, not true. Um, so just had a quick look at the chat.
I think you've jumped on mute, Heiko. I think you pushed the wrong button. <laughs> Thank you. So I hope I didn't go on for too long. So I just said mathematics is also an active research area. You know, some people think math is all done. There's a website or database that keeps track of you know, new math research, and they list an average more than 100,000 new research publications every year. So it's, it's very active. Um, what else? Well, math is challenging. I mean, speaking bluntly, if it's boring, uh, if, it's, if it's easy, everyone would do it and it's boring. You know, it wouldn't be worth talking about if we don't talk about how we breathe, right? <laughs> but, but mathematics is challenging, and it's, it's important to realize that. And it takes a lot of time and effort and the right attitude. But it's, it's similar to learning a new language, like, com like me coming from, from Germany. For me, it would be very hard to learn Mandarin or Chinese, for example. Right? And, and, and mathematics, to some extent, can be considered to be a different language. You have to learn the vocabulary, the grammar, the rules, and, and lots of notation as well. So it takes time, but it can be done. Right? As I said, it, it had been invented by humans for a reason. It's not something that fell out of the sky. Um, mathematics is rather a skill than a profession. You know, when you study math, this is what I tell my students, it's not so important what type of mathematics you study. It's about learning how to think mathematically. Right? It's sort of, it's a different way of thinking, a different way of reasoning. And along the way, you get a lot of key skills and qualifications. Again, usually I would ask for some keywords to be shouted in the room, but since we can't do this here, let me just unravel it. Well, there are problem solving and modeling skills. There are abstract, critical and logical thinking skills, creativity. You need to be creative. Look at our um, chessboard problem. You know, you have to have the idea, well, let's put this color in here and see what's happened. And you have to be creative in order to see these new innovations. You need to have high attention to detail and most importantly, you need to be patient and persistent. You know, in my everyday work, I'm basically, I'm stuck all the time. I mean, this is the start of school. I'm stuck on a problem, then I make some progress and then I'm stuck again. Right? Being stuck is just the normal thing. In, in, in science, probably in general, you know, you're always working on something and you're stuck and then you make a little bit of progress and then you continue. So you have to be patient and persistent. And it's these um, skills that really give you great flexibility on the job market. So I'm not sure if you have heard about it. There, there is um, careers, amz.org.au. They have a website about careers in mathematics. They have brochures, which is called Math Apps. And this brochure just contains ad job advertisements that look for some uh, mathematical skills. So don't read these um, lists here, just copy pasted some of the terms that showed up. And it's just to illustrate to you that, you know, ha having a math degree really gives you great flexibility because there are various places you can work in various disciplines where your skills are important. So check out this website. I think it's really, really interesting. And also, there's another website, um, CareerCast. They sort of analyze job satisfaction. They look at you know, what people earn and how satisfied they are and so on and so on. And in the last couple of years, in the top 10 jobs, there were always jobs listed that have something to do with mathematics. We have data scientist, statistician, mathematician, actuary, and so on. So it's just another piece of evidence to tell you that you know, if you do a math degree, you can actually do quite a bit of um, quite a bit of I mean there are lots of professions open to you essentially yeah that's that's I think the punchline of this slide so the conclusion um, of this part is that you should probably remember that mathematics is not just manipulating numbers it's really a different way of thinking so the analogy to learning a language is actually quite valid you learn a new language you learn a new way of thinking you you think more analytically, you have better reasoning skills. And um, that's just great. It's a great skill in every profession, really, right? If you have seen the videos that have been distributed um, with the worksheet, um, that has been very well illustrated, I guess. So that's important to realize. The second thing is to note that math is, is not really a profession, it's a skill. And that's also the problem why many people think, you know, what can you do with math? There is no math profession per se. Um, mathematics is a skill that you can apply in many, many different areas. And just to highlight my um, last master student, she, um, she was very keen in um, literature 
And she actually applied at Penguin Publisher, you know, that's a, like a scientific publisher, book publisher. And she got, she got a job offer for a scientific editor. Yeah? So even though she has done two math degrees, it doesn't mean that she can't follow her other passion, which is you know, working in the book industry. Um, okay, uh, saying that she actually declined that offer and she's now doing a PhD with me. But anyway, I mean, this is just illustrating that, you know, it doesn't mean that focusing on mathematics um, prohibits you to do other things you really like. You can combine this. And that's just because mathematics is a skill. So the punchline and also the advice I would have given myself is probably that, you know, if you, if you are interested in aspects of mathematics, I would just say, you know, be encouraged to pursue this further. And most importantly, maybe reach out to someone who can tell you a little bit more about that. Remember my story, when I didn't know what to study, I almost studied engineering, but I spoke to this professor in mathematics and these discussions eventually have convinced me to um, you know, do a math degree. So I think whatever you want to do, be, be it math or something else, I think you know, just get informed, speak to people who have some experience with this and, and then see what comes out of it. The last part of my presentation would be about my research, but I have cut this very short for the main reason really that um, I'm a pure mathematician. I'm doing fundamental research. So um, you might've seen one of the videos that was on the workbook about the bridges of Königsberg, which was about like a, a map uh, of the, the city of Königsberg and there were some bridges, right? And, and eventually it was discussed how this problem led to what's now called graph theory. You know, there are some, some people or some mathematicians who, who just study graphs, for example. You know, they don't care where these graphs come from. They might come from traffic modeling. They might come from social networks. They might come from a literal map where you have bridges. Yep, they don't care about this. They only are interested in studying these abstract mathematical objects graphs. And I'm, I'm of a similar type. I study uh, mathematical objects that have many, many applications in different sciences, but I just don't care really about these connections. I just focus on the mathematical object itself and see what I can say about it. So I'm trying to push the knowledge um, about these, these objects. But saying this, it makes it just um, quite difficult to talk about that in layman's terms, because you need a lot of vocabulary to speak about these objects. Huh? Remember I said, learning math is like learning a language. Um, and you need to have a certain amount of vocabulary to really talk about that in a sensible way. So here are two papers of mine, just copy pasted. And you just see there isn't a lot of calculation going on. It's basically just text, a couple of cryptic symbols, and then some reasoning. Yeah, so this is how my type of mathematics looks like. I basically argue and give logical reasons. So I, I don't talk about my, my work um, like in detail, I think what I, how, I, how I would describe my work in general is that in, in broad terms, I study symmetries. Yeah, so what symmetry, so symmetry can mean many things. In general, you, you would say that an object has symmetry if, if it can somehow be transformed in a way that um, leaves it looking in the same way as before. Now, like look at this triangle here on the right-hand side. You can, you can rotate it, you can rotate it um, by 120 degrees left or right, and then it basically looks like before, or you can, reflect it, and again, it looks like, like it before. Now, so this triangle has exactly six symmetries. Now you have the rotations and the reflections, and you can show that this is all. And now you can essentially forget about where these um, symmetries come from. You just have a mathematical description of these symmetries, and this is then called a group, and I look at groups. This is roughly speaking what I'm, what I'm doing. So why symmetry of interest? Well, I guess everyone has an idea that symmetry occur uh, everywhere around us. Symmetry also means stability. For example, if you look at this uh, Buckminster Fuller in here, um, this is a, a chemical molecule that has lots of symmetry and is very stable. Um, symmetry introduces strength and, and stability, as I said, and symmetries can also be used to recover information to some extent. So they are really, really important. And I'm one of the people who just focus on sort of the abstract notion of symmetry and just study, you know, what can you do with it? And more technically, you could say what I'm doing is computational group theory. I study groups, which are abstract mathematical objects that somehow capture the notion of symmetry. And I do this assisted by computers. And this goes in two ways. Firstly, I 
do computer experiments and they tell me how things look like. And this gives me some ideas of what I could prove in theory. But then on the other hand, if you want to do these computer experiments, you also have to have computers you can actually do that, right? Someone has to come up with algorithms that allow you to do these computations. And I'm also contributing to this side. So I'm, I'm also developing algorithms for that. And um, yeah, this is, is also one part of my work. So this basically concludes my, my presentation. And here in the background, you see another paper I wrote recently with my, with my master's student and actually my PhD supervisor. So this is a three generation, three generation um, paper. So Bettina Eich was my PhD supervisor and I'm now the PhD supervisor of Shu Yu Pan. And you see again that what's written here in the background, it's, it's a lot of text, yeah? it's a lot of text. And this is group theory I mentioned before. This is talking about these abstract objects that capture symmetry. But the way we do it, it's just, we use sort of a foreign language, the language of mathematics to talk about these objects and to reason about these objects. And I guess it's fair to say that this looks different to what you do um, at school. All right, so this concludes my presentation. Um, I hope you enjoyed it a little bit, even though it's, it's weird to have it as a monologue. It's, it's hard to, to do this without really um, optical and verbal feedback. Anyway, thank you. Uh, I would much rather have been playing with Lego, I think. <laughs> 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 it's definitely where, where I'm at, but it was it, it's been a really fantastic to, to look at maths in a completely different way because I also have not done uh, maths in school and you think it's just you know numbers and and you come out with something at the end and actually doing all the reasoning and the logic that goes with it is is fantastic. Um, so I'm, I'm wanting to sit on your research a little bit about the symmetry and the, and the computational analysis. Have you had some real applications that have come out from things that you've worked on that we that have kind of gone out into the world and and become something? Um, well, there are two aspects to that. Um, I think most applications of my work are still within the scientific disciplines. So, as I said, part of my work is to um, enhance algorithms, to produce algorithms, to to create implementations. And these implementations, they are distributed with what's called computer algebra systems. Yeah. They are academic lead computer programs and they keep track of who is using these systems. And they have tens of thousands citations in, S in, in biology, physics, chemistry, and so on. So this is sort of one contribution where my work has an impact on, on other disciplines. And I do actually have one or two papers which are Likely bought three papers which are interdisciplinary, but probably not very satisfactory <laughs> to your, your question because it's it's sort of applied to theoretical physics uh, in black hole theory, which which for me is an application of my work. But if the like people outside academia would consider black hole research to be a real world application, it's probably <laughs> questionable. I also have a joint publication now with a theoretical computer scientist. You know, when you talk about algorithms in general, there are two aspects. You know, you might just be interested in having programs that work in practice. You know, you can just do stuff, but you also might want to look at these algorithms from a complexity point of view, which sort of measures, you know, how efficient are these programs running? And this is not always the same. There are some algorithms that have theoretical bad complexity, but for most practical instances, you can actually work with them. And on the other hand, there are algorithms that have good theoretical complexity, but it's still impractical to work with them. So there are two sides really. And I've recently um, collaborated with a computer scientist where we combined these two aspects and proved that a practical algorithm has a certain good complexity. So my, my work has some applications outside my core area, uh, but it's still sort of in the scientific realm, I would say. And so when you're working with computers on, on your stuff, it's not just a, a laptop, is it? It's these are bigger computers that you're working that that you're kind of doing algorithms with, or is it something? It depends. It depends. So I'm, I have short. So when I just check some examples and, and you know, do everyday work, I'm, I'm using my desktop computer. Um, some of my larger classification work, I mean, that has been run for weeks on some other machines that are standing in my offices. Um, 
it is still it's still a desktop machine, well, a high-end desktop machine, and and it can easily happen that computations run for weeks. So when I had my um, postdoc in Auckland, they had dedicated servers, and some computations ran for years, really. Oh wow! <laughs> because they just had to check so many different cases. So that that can happen. Yes. Definitely getting past the pen and paper maths that I that I'm on to. <laughs> it's definitely yes. past that. Uh, so I guess um, we were talking a little bit about the the multiple careers that you can go into with maths. Why choose to become a pure mathematician and not say an engineer or uh, a, a computer engineer or something like that? What drew yeah, you so to do this? <laughs> at which stage? Um... So you're, uh, are you referring to? I guess when, when you kind of, obviously the, the choice to go to New Zealand meant that it was definitely you were on that that track to do the postdoc and, and be yes. that sort of a, a, a researcher into maths and pure maths. Mm. That that would have been a very big decision to move to New Zealand. I mean, hey, you've ended up here, which is good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a big decision also because of my, my family who joined me. I mean, that's a big, big thing to say, you know, I quit my job in Germany and, and go here. Yeah, I mean, why a pure mathematician? Well, I think, as I tried to indicate earlier, it's it's a long process. You know, it's not that you go to year 12 and you say, oh, I want to become a pure mathematician, professor in pure math. <laughs> I mean, as I said, you might have the aspiration that you 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 so much that you like the subject so much and you want to to do this, but it's it's really hard to like see seriously plan this out. So I think you should only really work from one step. To the other you know if you like math or if you like science you know sign up for a science undergraduate degree once you do that you will see you know do you really like this area more or do you like maybe more chemistry again coming back to my my master's student but she's just a great example she actually started out doing chemistry and then she somehow thought well i actually prefer math and you now eventually she's doing a math phd so it just illustrates that I mean, over this long period of time, obviously your preferences change and there are other opportunities and you know, you have to be flexible in the end. Maybe, I mean, maybe if I would have decided to do engineering, I would have been an engineer now. I don't know, hard to say. <laughs> it is the beauty of science though. It's very kind of flexible. You can take the skills from one section to another section and do something fantastical. That is, that's true. <laughs> I, I have had a, a question about the language of maths and being mm. a universal language. Um, so do you think that if we encountered aliens, uh, would, would they attempt to communicate in maths, do you think? That's a good question. It's a good question. Actually, I think I, I remember I saw a YouTube video on that, <laughs> and I'm afraid my response won't be so qualified. But yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, Given what I said, if, if they come from a similar physical world and they make the same observations as we have done as humans, for example, right mm -hmm. angle triangles and, and prime numbers, I think numbers is probably a concept you would imagine other civilizations also come up with. So maybe prime numbers are also a natural concept. And you know, you might have seen this movie, what was it, Con is it Contact with Jodie Foster, oh, yes. which is a like 20 or 30 years ago, but they also communicated via prime numbers, I think. So yeah, who knows? Yeah, it, It's because it's absolutes. I guess it would be a good way, a com good common ground to, to communicate maybe. And as I said, you know, all the other sciences, sciences seem to be more focused on modeling the world. You know, when you look at most aspects of physics or chemistry or biology, you, you try to explain the world around you. But mathematics, a part of it has really um, uh, philosophical tendencies. You know, it's, it's more or less a philo philosophy, you know, basically. For example, I mean, what is a proof, for example, right? You, you can debate about that. And, and I like these aspects quite a bit. Yeah, I think it's been a really lovely look at, at the different things of maths because I probably came in much like a lot of our audience, which was, oh, it's, you know, all of those big calculations that get done on boards and you have to keep redoing them over again and everything from mm. the times tables to that. So I'm, I mean, it's I'm just very... part of it. I mean, there, there are obviously, I mean, there are applied areas in mathematics where you have to compute a lot, really, but you have specific real world applications in mind to like to do some real problem solving. This is also an important aspect of mathematics, but I intentionally try to avoid this because it, it would be more about computing stuff. So here I really wanted to focus on that math is not necessarily 
just about manipulating numbers. Yeah, it's it's about reasoning. That's the main thing I would say. And that's a skill we all need. Yes. <laughs> Creativity and reasoning. Well, thank you so much, Heike, for, for joining us today and um My pleasure. And you know, telling us a lot about about your work and your maths. And I'm hoping that our guys who've logged in today will take the time to look through those links that we've sent because it was it was lovely for me to have a look through and, and to see the different a different way of looking at maths today so uh, thank you for joining me thank you all for joining us as well in the audience you will be redirected to a survey which would be great if you could give us a little bit of feedback on today's talk uh, what you liked what you didn't like what we can include for future events we have another one coming up next week Dr Erin Hahn will be joining us on Tuesday next week but for now I wanted to thank you Heiko and all of our audience for joining us today Thank you, Camille. Thanks, everyone, for coming.